G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for yet another video today, having a look at uh, some of the bigger name recruits from last year's trade period who are going to play for their clubs for the first time this year. Going through the list of players that switch clubs and trying to make an assessment of which recruits are likely to have the most impact for their club both this season and I suppose with a longer term view as well. Trade recruits, uh, it's really not just about the first season they are at a new club and making an assessment based on that. It's not all about season one impact. There's a lot of different variables and of course we do know that as well that it's not always the most high profile expensive recruits that end up being the best value pickups. I mean look at last year we had Tyson Stengel, uh, we had Will Brody as well. Those guys were virtually free and they were arguably the two of the recruits of the season last year. But nonetheless we're going to go through some of the bigger name trades and I'll make a bit of an assessment based on how I think they will go this year and who I think is likely to have the most impact. Now, as you should know by now, the True Footy YouTube channel is now in partnership with Druzy's Athlete Academy, which offers online strength and conditioning coaching for whether you be a young athlete who's trying to take their game to the next level, or if you're just a young guy who wants to level up in the gym. Either way, Druzy set out to help you achieve what you want to achieve through structured online programs. Now, I gotta say, getting physically fit is so important. I know that's one thing that I've been focusing on uh, in this off season. If you like, I've been hitting the gym hard. I've dropped about five kilos over that summer period. And uh, I gotta say, when you feel strong and you feel fit, it just makes you walk that little bit taller. As a fully qualified sports scientist, Druzy can offer you programs tailored to your specific goals. So it's time to invest in yourself. Check out the link in the description or go to Druzy Athlete Academy com and uh, for any program that you decide to undertake you can get 20% off with true footy by using the code true footy 20 he's also offering free video consults so go to Instagram Druzy athlete Academy again I'll leave the details in the description if you DM him zoom it will set up a free 15 to 20 minute consultation where you can just talk about your goals but let's crack on with the content of this video and I'm going to talk through 10 of the biggest profile recruits or at least in my opinion and uh, go through what sort of impact we anticipate they will have on their clubs. We'll start off with Josh Dunkley, who in my opinion was probably the best quality player to switch clubs last year, going from the Bulldogs to the Brisbane Lions. The cost was pick 21, a future first, a future second, and a future fourth, and they got two uh, future thirds back. So like I said, on established talent and what he's produced at AFL level, probably the best player to switch clubs. He's 26 years old, played 116 games, so he's right in the prime of his career, and uh, he's a genuine A-grade footballer as well and one that I think will add a nice sort of balance to what the Brisbane Lions already have. They've already got a strong team, a strong midfield in particular, but he's a midfielder who can play forward as well, kicked 18 goals last season. On top of that, he averaged 25 and a half disposals as well. So his versatility makes him an asset. He's a proven, established A-grade player and Brisbane are right in there for contention as well. So like I said, it may not always be this way where the most expensive recruit becomes the best prospect, but as far as that red Resume goes, that certainly makes a compelling case to be the most impactful recruit for a team this year. Next, we'll talk about Tim Taranto and Jacob Hopper, and I've kind of bundled them in together because they're both left from the GWS Giants to join Richmond's midfield. The cost cumulatively was picks 12, 19, and 31, and a future first. So the Tigers have stumped up some heavy draft capital to get two young midfielders uh, who are around about the prime of their career. Taranto's uh, 25 years old and played 141 games. We know that he's a high quality midfielder. I think he won the best and fairest in 2019 in the year where GWS, of course, made the grand final. And over the last four years, his production's been fairly consistent. When he'd sort of take out the shortened quarters back in 2020, he's maintained 20 to 25 disposals a game, pretty much. On top of that, he hits the scoreboard every now and then. He's usually good for about nine or 10 goals a season. So like Dunkley, another player who can play forward. And we know with Richmond's mix there, he's probably gonna get rotated forward with Cochin and Martin, etc. Hopper's 26, he's played 114 games and his output has been very similar for GWS over that stretch. Of course, he had a down year last year. In 2022, he just played the seven games, but another player right in his prime, we're about to enter his prime. The effect of both of these recruits really suggests that Richmond is trying to prolong their premiership window, or at least extend it. We know that with Richmond's list, uh, at least one thing I've been saying for a while is that on paper, their midfield uh, doesn't really 
equate to a premiership quality side not so much you know the team that won the premiership but what it is now in its current evolution they've got an aging Cochin who might play forward like I said Dusty is also sort of towards the end of his career I think he'll be 32 this year so adding a prime Taranto and Hopper is a huge move not just for this year but perhaps the next few years as Richmond try and keep their window open another high profile trade of course last year was Luke Jackson leaving Melbourne to join the Fremantle footy club here in WA and the cost for that was quite significant so naturally you'd be hoping for some sort of return on that the cost was pick 13 a future first and a future second in the draft and arguably the most talented player to switch clubs so I said that Dunkley is the best player but when you consider potential obviously I, I suppose many people have mixed views on Luke Jackson and what he's actually going to become at AFL level. But when you consider that he was a scrawny ruckman, he's already played 52 games, he's already a premiership ruckman, it's hard to argue against the immense potential that this guy has. On top of that as well, it is way before a ruckman such as him should be entering his prime as well. So again, this is really important to state. This is a longer term uh, deal for Fremantle. This is not uh, necessarily a plug in and play. 2023, you're going to help us win a premiership. We're probably looking at the next three or four years for Jackson to really evolve into the player that Fremantle obviously clearly believe he is going to be. Longer term, you know, the ceiling is that he could be Fremantle's best player in a few years. And shorter term, he comes in probably to sort of replace Lobb, I guess, is that, that tall forward presence and also obviously back up in the ruck to Sean Darcy as well. Although this talk that Jackson might sort of play this high half forward and even midfield role as well. He's been doing a bit of roving. We do know that he's an athletic freak as well. So it'll be interesting to see where his position settles. Obviously, he's going to play from round one if fit. So I guess to sum up, you know, Fremantle do have a flag tilt this year. Luke Jackson is certainly good enough already to have a genuine impact on that and be a very good player. But again, I think it's important to stress this one is probably, you know, a recruit over the next five to 10 years. That's how he will be assessed. Next on the list is Dan McStay, and while he may not be as talented as some of the other players on this list, I still think this was a key structural move for Collingwood, and that's why uh, he could be a fairly high impact, especially in relation to the cost. Of course, we know that he was a free agent, so Collingwood only gave up salary to acquire him. Long story short, we know that McStay is a key position forward, and that's something that Collingwood has lacked, even as good as they were last year, and uh, you know, a few years ago when they made the grand final as well. Even throughout those years, they haven't really had a locked and loaded key forward presence who's going to kick the majority of those goals. We know that over the last four years, if I'm not mistaken, Majacek has led their goal kicking. I love Majacek. He's an absolute gun, but he's not a true key forward either. So structurally, they've had this uh, sort of gaping hole in their forward line, which have now filled, and it may not be absolutely pertinent that McStay comes in and becomes an A grader, but if he adds a bit of a foil to Majacek, to Goey, Junivan, Jamie Elliott, I think there will be some genuine benefits there to Collingwood just for having him in the side. He's not an absolute goal machine. He's never kicked more than 28 goals in a season, but if they get 28 goals this year out of McStay, it still adds a different dimension to their forward thrust as well. So I think this could be an interesting one. And Collingwood, as good as they were last year, now have a different dimension to their forward line. Next on the list, I've included Brody Grundy, who uh, swapped from Collingwood to join Melbourne for just pick 27, which seems ludicrous when you consider it wasn't that long ago he was the best ruck in the game or close to, and pick 27 is a pretty bargain price. And obviously reflective of the fact that he hasn't hit his best form for a number of years, and obviously as well, the massive contract that he was on meant that he probably came at a slightly discounted price as well. But I just find this one very, very difficult to forecast how he's gonna go at Melbourne. And he, he comes in more or less as a Luke Jackson replacement, because Luke Jackson leaves that best 22, and now Melbourne have ensured that they will never have a ruck disadvantage this year as they have Grundy and Gorn playing in the same team now. When you consider value for the deal versus what they could potentially get out of Brody Grundy, I think this one is uh, potentially quite exciting for them. And like I said, theoretically, most teams will have a period where their second ruck is rucking and they'll go to having a disadvantage. But when you have Gorn and Grundy going back to back, uh, there's no respite for opposition ruck. So this will add a real competitive advantage for the Demons who are already strong in this area. Where he will fit in Melbourne side uh, and the, the balance of Gorn and Grundy is a difficult question to, to answer with Gorn and Grundy both really being number one rucks trying to share the load. We do know that Gorn can play around the ground as well. So we expect that maybe Grundy takes uh, the more of the majority of the taps, um, but it will be interesting to watch exactly how that balance unfolds. So this one is a little bit more multifaceted because 
uh, the, the impact that Grundy adds will be in the short term, replace Jackson, keeps Melbourne's rucks really strong throughout this uh, premiership window they're in. But it also might prove fruitful in this fact that, you know, Gorn's going to retire not too, not in the too distant future, I would have thought. I think he's 32 this year, and Grundy, by comparison, I think is turning 29. So it certainly makes that transition easier, but I do anticipate there's a good chance that Grundy has a profound impact on Melbourne this season. Next, I want to talk about Tom Mitchell, who joined Collingwood, leaving Hawthorne this offseason for the low cost of just picks 41 and 50. I think that was a three-way deal where Ollie Henry also was involved, but I've broken it down, and 41 and 50 is more or less what Collingwood gave up for him. This one presents to me as the likely highest value recruit. We know that after last year, Collingwood have shot themselves right back into flag contention. So what they've done is recruited a 29 year old midfielder who to me seems like his prime is, uh, is is extended you know I don't think that Tom Mitchell necessarily is anywhere near the end of his career and for that price Collingwood have picked up a guy who can impact a premiership tilt now and still be there in two to three years time actually to be honest with you I think Tom Mitchell is the sort of player who could play to 35 or 36 but we'll see how we go but the recruitment of Mitchell adds some immediate reinforcement to Collingwood's midfield. It's already a strong midfield when you consider Taylor Adams is a great player on his day. Jack Crisp as well, still side bottom, although he's in the twilight of his career. You got Pendlebury and the Dacos brothers uh, rotating through there as well and Degoe as well. So we did see Mitchell's production drop off a little bit last year and I think that was likely due to role and obviously the transition that's happening there at Hawthorne. In 2021, he averaged 34 disposals. Last year, even though I just said it was a drop off, he still averaged 28 disposals. This guy's a Brownlow medalist. I don't think his baseline of form is ever that low. Therefore, I think Collingwood know what they're getting out of Tom Mitchell. I can see this move being a really big success. He's a former Brownlow medalist, like I said. So they've added a really, really high talent who's likely to deliver on that promise and they've got him for very cheap. Next, I want to talk about Rory Lobb, who left Fremantle to join the Western Bulldogs uh, for just pick 30 and a future second round pick as well. Over the course of his career, I think Lobb's been a bit of a frustrating player considering the early GWS form that we saw. I remember seeing him kick about five goals on West Coast in about 2016, and I remember thinking this guy is going to be an absolute A grader. I don't know. I think some of that's been injury. I don't think he's played more than 20 games in a season between 2017 and last year. He just hasn't really got on the park consistently. He's had some setbacks. I think he's also a bit of a laconic style player, so it looks like he's not trying hard, but he may actually be. One thing that surprised me is that this guy is 30 this year. That surprised me uh, big time. I thought he was younger than that. But with that in mind, obviously, it's not so much about the promise anymore. It's just about the player that we know Rory Lobb is. And he did have a great season last year in a surging Fremantle side. He kicked 36 goals from 21 games, and that was in a side that needed a key forward presence, and he played the role really well. I think he comes in and adds a really good foil to someone like Aaron Norton, who kicked 51 goals last year. Obviously, I'm a big fan of uh, what Aaron Norton can do on a footy field. He's a, a great uh, sort of young talent as a key forward. Um, but when you consider that the next batch of kickers or goal kickers for the Bulldogs uh, in Cody Waitman, Bont, and Dunkley. None of those players are true key forwards. So he sort of adds another dimension there as that tall presence. You also factor in Dunkley has left the club. That's 18 goals that have left. So Lobb comes in as another genuine goal kicker. We do know they've got Sam Darcy, Jamara Ugalhagen. These kids will need time. Lobb's 30. He can tie them over for a few years there. And Bruce, uh, since he did his ACL, I think he played five games last year, kicked one goal. So it's a little bit of a question mark there. Long story short, the Bulldogs now are a side another side looking to capitalize on their premiership window and I think Lobb coming in kicking 30 to 35 goals again would be a massive boost to that best 22. The second last player I want to mention is Isaac Rankin who made his way from the Gold Coast Suns to the Adelaide Crows. Uh, it was essentially pick five was the trade and then a swap of later picks as well. There's some mixed opinions on Rankin as well to be honest but I personally see the makings of a very very good small forward who had to play his trade, do his apprenticeship at a side that ultimately hasn't been successful and obviously you know, you know Gold Coast are coming up the ranks and you could say that Adelaide haven't been great either but personally I'm excited to see what he could do in a good team and I do have this weird faith that at Adelaide we're going to see the best of Isaac Rankin. Last year the Gold Coast Suns obviously did improve massively 
effectively, and so did Rankin's output. Played 18 games in both 2021 and 22, and uh, his goal tally went from 16 to 29, so it virtually doubled. He's turning 23 this year, and while the Crows are probably against the odds to play finals, I think a talented player like Isaac Rankin entering his prime is a very, very exciting prospect for them. Again, this probably isn't a question of how much Rankin will impact in his first season. However, I think over the next three years, they will start to see a really good return on that investment. In terms of round one and beyond though, I am excited to see what a forward line of Rankin and Rochelle working together will provide. The final player on this list that I want to mention is Anthony McDonald tipping Woody. It's funny to include him on this list because uh, he's not technically a recruit, but he kind of really is at the same time. He left Essendon, came out of retirement. He's back on the list, didn't play a game last year. So effectively, he is a recruit for Essendon. I'm counting it. I'm excited to see this guy back in the league, and I think he will be a massive boost to an Essendon side that stagnated really hard last year. When the Dons played finals, Tipper played 20 games, he kicked 34 goals, and I think it's another one of those players where the stats don't tell the full story because he can turn half opportunities into opportunities and considering that the Don's expectation is in my eyes clearly to play finals okay so they sacked their coach because he got nowhere near finals after making it in 2021 the expectation is to at least get close to finals I would say and tipping Woody could potentially be a huge part of that push from the reports that I've read he's a good chance to be playing round one and uh, with a side with a lot of developing young talent I'm particularly interested to see him line up against the likes of you know Stringer and Wright who's really come on over the last couple of years recruited Sam Wiedemann they got Archie Perkins as well there's suddenly a pretty talented dynamic up forward for the Dons and I think we could see some fireworks from Tipping Woody this season so that's sort of how I saw the top 10 uh, recruits from last year and, and what impact we expect from them both you know in 2023 and the future seasons. I'll throw out some honorable mentions. I couldn't mention everyone. Jack Bowes, obviously. Jason Horn Francis, I didn't quite include him because, again, he's going to be in his second season, so it's so, so early. Jack Gunston, Carl Amon, Junior Rioli, Griffin Logue, Aaron Francis, those sort of um, sort of mid-tier players that aren't quite A-graders, but I could think could add a lot to their size. I could easily see one of them being the most impactful from last season. Then there's Liam Jones, and then a couple of draftees. Will Ashcroft, you know, if he's a Dacos level talent, could we see a Dacos level output? Probably not, but if he gets close, that'd be pretty damn interesting. Harry Shears was another player that I think will bob up and uh, probably improve North Melbourne's forward line early days. I'm a big fan of his work. So like I said at the start of the video, last year, the two recruits of the season were arguably Stengel and Will Brody. So who will it be this year, guys? Let me know in the comments what you think, who do you think is likely to be the uh, either the, the best value recruit or the most impactful. I'm interested in your opinion. So thanks, guys. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.